so it's not describing himself very well. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the geography program at San Diego State, and I say that for a reason. Once in a while, occasionally I'm very proud to say that. I am today. That was a good job. So, uh, but anyway, I also like to give for it again. You know, uh, how much time we have? You still doing okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I appreciate you welcoming us here. You know, Brian does a good job of welcoming us here. This is at least the second time. And, and we show up kind of ratty and stuff with the field course, so we're in the field. Right? Um, you know, I would say the research I'd be working on has focused on blues culture. It, I would rather probably say it this way. Um, my life has been focused on this probably for the last 15 years or so. Um, and a, a lot of what I focus on deals in some form or fashion in terms of blues culture, particularly in terms of this area, the point of the work of it. The Mississippi Delta, some of you probably heard, heard this place before. Um, when I say blues culture, let me just say, I'm not just talking about music, but the culture, the, the social and cultural and environmental, for example, context of where that music comes from, right? And you know, um, one of the things that's fascinating to me about this region, and some of you students just came with me, I, tell, I say this all the time, is when you're talking about the Delta, or the music from the Delta, <laughs> nothing is as it appears to be. It's not even the Delta. Right. Some of you may know. It's a floodplain, right? right. Um, the music, if we think we know a lot about it, but how it's, it's very romanticized, it's a, lot, a lot of what we know is based on myth and hearsay and perhaps just historical context. Um, I use this gentleman, which I assume, excuse me, on the left, that many of you may know, Robert Johnson. Uh, if you know him, you probably know him because of his myth. He went, he went to this crossroads in the middle of the night, sold his soul to the devil to fame and fortune. All right. All right, that's, you know, I have a different theory. Um, and, you know, he sold his soul or not, I don't know. I think he probably practiced a lot and uh, is a creative musician. Well, it was creative in the sense that he wasn't some African bard, you know, focusing on some kind of folk music that goes back in time. Rather, he was someone who was very interconnected to the modern music of his day, and was creative about our bits and pieces of it and expressing it in a unique way, right? I think practice is probably a better way to do it if you want to be famous, right? Than so so say. But that's okay, right? Because I think that's, that's you know, it's part of the power of blues, right? It's, it's, there's stories to it. Um, that, so that's one thing I would say that makes this region fascinating. Nothing's ever was that it appears to be. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. And I, I guess as, a, as an academic, if any of you are academics, I know some of you are, administrators always like to say, well, you ought to be able to make a bridge between the research and the teaching you do. And most, most of the times, that's, that's a problem. Right? Um, that's very difficult to do. I have done it. I, you know, I do a lot of field courses. This is one. Right? Um, students that are here, we come to a wide. Now, we focus a little bit differently on, on things when we're here than what I do when I take students to the Delta or when we take students to Spain. But I like to say there's a lot more to the similarity between Mississippi and Hawaii than just good food. Right? Um, in a lot of ways, and for that matter of Spain, one thing that connects all these three places is music, which we'll talk a little about. But also, they're, they're all three unique regions. And part of the, the reason they're unique is they're what I call cultural crossroads. They're places where the uniqueness of the place is that it's been influenced by so many different places, right? Um, so in that sense, there's a very important cultural parallel between all three of these places. So what, I, what I've sort of been focusing on, I guess, for a while is exactly how can we use blues, music, and culture as a lens to think about how these three places are connected globally and how blues music, which has been defined in different ways over time, is really what I would call transcultural, meaning that it's something that's really very diverse and complex not so simple as it may, it may appear to be. Right? Um, now this map, there's a lot going on here, I know that. And I, I told Rod this talk could last three hours. I could spend an hour and a half on this map, but I'm gonna overgeneralize a little bit. I've thought a lot about how to sort of understand where blues come from right, geographically. And it's like, a, I think the thing that makes it interesting when you do so, you just keep going back, right? And you don't know, maybe B.B. King would say blues originated when it was no good cheap man. Well, 
might have been Adam. I don't know. Um, but what I've sort of thought about, the way to make sense of it uh, geographically is look at it as a cultural form, as something that is a result of movements. When I say movements, I'm talking about migration or the diffusion of culture or space, or for that matter, social movements, like the civil rights movement. I don't want to get off into that area too much, but so to a degree, that form of movement is what allows me to really understand the geographical roots of this. And what I've done here in this map is show what I call four pathways. And it's not a very up-to-date map, I, map, I apologize. But the idea of this, what we're seeing is these arrows are indicating movement. And even though it's suggesting movement in one direction, reality, what we're looking at is cultural exchange. And uh, but one thing I would point out here is that just envision this being blues culture and it's moving over space. It's kind of circulating across a portion of the earth. Right? Well, the music itself changes after it impacts each destination. At the same time, the music changes that destination. Right? The music sort of evolves over time and space in this way. So for example, on the pathway number one, we, we, if you go back and look at where blues comes from, certain elements we know come from the monotone, monotone cadences associated with Islamic prayer, right? Um, certain types of, of use of instrumentation that you see in the Islamic world or in the Moorish world. At some point in time, back in time, there was cultural exchange between that northern part of, of Africa and Western Africa, and the more animistic portions of West Africa, which is the source for most slaves to, to North America. And you see, for example, more rhythm and polyrhythms and, and syncopated rhythms and things like that. The idea being that the music's already interacting over space before it actually gets here. At this point, it wouldn't have been called blues, obviously. And then, of course, you had <clears throat> the middle passage during the slave trade. People from West Africa were brought to, to <clears throat> North America. I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring South America for a reason. Um, it, the music manifests in different forms depending on where it goes. I mean, we know when you talk about blues in North America, you can you refer to regional differences between the Delta Blues or East Texas Blues or Piedmont Blues. Um, you know, the the idea at this point is, you know, African-oriented music starts emerging with European music, right? And a lot of people refer to the so-called blues scale as an attempt for people who were trying to adjust to a new form of Western civilization, right? Uh, now, when I originally made this map, I jumped back across the pond, right? But the reality speaking, and I should emphasize our, in, our individuals here, if you look at the number of men over to the lower right, my students don't know who that is. They just failed in the class to take me. It's Muddy Waters. Right? <laughs> he is symbolic of something, right? He's considered to be sometimes the father of electric blues, right? And his music, of course, moved across the pond. Before it did so, he went from Mississippi, the Delta, to Chicago. Right? So really, I have another little form arrow going up there because the music that went across the pond, you know, went north and west first, right? <laughs> then it goes across the pond in terms of arrow number three there. That happened in the form of post-war radio, uh, record sales, and eventually a lot of people, including Muddy Waters himself, would go over and perform, right? Um, now that hit pretty big. Uh, there's a really interesting story about the reactions a promoter who brought him over to Europe, um, and they thought they were getting Huddy Ledbetter, a folk artist. And he shows up in an Italian suit and Tom Terror and shocked the sensibility of the Fender cast. Um, but that hit really heavy, right, in places like Liverpool and London, et cetera. You know, what happened then? Well, people were brought it back. It's folks from the lower right, right? The Rolling Stones took their name from one of Muddy Waters' songs. Beatles and animals, what we now call the British invasion, brought blues back to North America in the form of what we ultimately became called rock and roll. There's another interesting story. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you have seen this. The Beatles, although I would tell you the Beatles weren't directly influenced by blues and the Stones, and therefore inferior. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it's a joke, right? Uh, but if you ever see this, when they, in 1964, they were right before they go on the Ed Sullivan show, they're being interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter asks, so where, now that you're here in America, where are you, what are you going to do? And John Lennon says, well, Walt, we want to see Muddy Waters. And the reporter says, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> and Lennon, as classic Lennon said, you crazy Yankees, you don't even know who your heroes are. But I think that's a, that's, that's a humorous story, but it kind of tells you when we say that it took 
British fans to bring it back to North America. That's, there's some truth to that, right? Um, <clears throat> now, one thing I would mention to you, and I, I like to get, hear talk about music, you gotta talk to a musician, right? Bono, you two believe the singer, he was actually talking about Elvis, right? Which, of course, could be part of the story. He said, you know, Elvis had hips that flew from Africa to Europe, right? He, he, he probably needed to swivel twice, and he missed something, right? Um, he missed this, right? Now we know, that, and there's overwhelming that. I can't even share all of them with you today, but there's a good bit of evidence, not just anecdotally, right? <laughs> Through historical narratives, from interviews, from blues artists themselves, from you know technique references, to historical references, to song titles, that there was an Hawaiian influence into the blues before it actually, well, actually, even before it was even called blues. So that's really what I want to focus on a little bit today, and sort of what, how, did, how this exactly happened. Um, and what I would tell you in terms of the Delta, I, I think you could view it as a prism, right? Through which you have all these influences coming in and going out in different directions, right? But I would tell you it's not just the only prism. I mean, you can think of Hawaii and even Spain as places where you had multiple cultural influences that have a musical manifestation that all sort of end up in what we now call blues, right? Um, so a couple other arrows, or I should say trends, that, that I didn't get to discuss, and something that, to be perfectly honest, is totally ignored in the music industry or among musicologists, I think, um, is that we don't realize this, but in a period of time, 1900, 1918, the most popular music in the mainland U.S. was Hawaiian music. Uh, and it wasn't even close, right? Now what happened, World War I, some economic change, so there was a, the record industry as a whole kind of went downhill for a period of time. But for a period of time, Hawaiian music, it was viewed, viewed as sort of exotic and, and kind of interesting and, and, and unique and things like that. It was the top selling music in the country at that time. Right? Um, so it would be the mainstream music industry theme during that period of time. The other thing that, that I, I mentioned Spain a little bit, what we can now see is that both Hawaiian music musicians and blues artists were influenced by this particular phenomenon. <laughs> um, in 1860, an English guy who had been living in Spain wrote a song called the original Spanish Fandango. And Fandango is an African word that is uh, references you know, like dance form. Right? And he wrote this song and he, he, it later became another song, also style, uh, style playing the guitar, where you use open chords, what we now call the open G. Right? Later on, a lot of blues artists and a lot of Hawaiian guitarists, particularly struggling ones, would buy guitars from the Sears and Robot catalog. If you bought a guitar from the Sears and Robot catalog, it gave you a little lesson plan to learn how to play. One of the songs that was in that lesson plan was this one. So it, Muddy Waters bought his guitar from Sears and Robot Catalog. Right? Um, so in a way, I think you, you see already there's a, a Spanish influence in a way, which is kind of interesting. The other thing I would tell you about both these individuals, um, Mississippi John Hurt, this Hawaiian woman on the right, they were both depicted, and you can kind of look at how she's dressed by, the, by promoters as being folk artists, right? Sort of representing lost art and culture from their respective home towns or wherever they came from. In reality, they were modern musicians, really tapped into what was happening everywhere, right? just like Robert Johnson was. Um, and I think the interesting thing about music is how we sometimes interpret it is not necessarily where the musician is coming from. Um, now, what I want to focus just directly is the Hawaiian influence. We can talk about a lot of things. But you know, one of the things that makes Delta Blues distinctive and one of the reasons that was so influential in terms of rock and roll and everything else that came behind it, the rap, was the disproportionate use of the slide guitar. Muddy Waters was fam famous as other Delta musicians for being for using a guitar to mimic a voice by using a slide. Right? And by a slide, what you ultimately do is you get a you know a metal bar, a knife, or something. Um, Dwayne Allman used a course seed bottle. Uh, which was uh, antihistamine. I don't think he had cold. He, he also probably, for a period of time, that was Red Devils, which was used recreationally, I 
<laughs> but uh, the point being, what you can effectively do if you open the use open chords and you raise the, the guitar strings off a fret, off the fret a little bit, it increases the volume and it also can change the pitch, effectively create new notes. Right? So now, why I mentioned that? That's sort of the signature delta sound. Right? Where did that come from? Well, historians have always said, you know. This goes back to the home country, in this case, Buffalo and Africa. <clears throat> Everyone <clears throat> refers to diddly bows, a common instrument that used was that a lot of Delta musicians would use. We'd get the broom or whatever, and maybe a piece of, of, of uh, um, some kind of cord or, or bailing wire or something like that, and nail it and put some, some kind of bottle to lift it up, and you could kind of use a slide. In Africa, there's instruments that sort of resemble this, sometimes referred to as ziddler. <clears throat> or zither, or what's sometimes in the Delta are called jitterbugs. Uh, now, now it's interesting. You, it's still to this day you hear this mentioned as well. This is something that's it's made this leap. Like this is an Africanism. It's evident in blue. Now, ironically, um, you start looking at historical evidence and talking to musicians. Not that I've ever talked to Muddy Waters, but you start reading interviews. None of there's no record of a slide ever being used. So like the thirds, right? This, this just this doesn't show up. No one's using it. No one's talking about it. No one claims to have even seen it until the thirds, right? Um, but <clears throat> since what happened after the thirties, you start to see a lot of musicians use what's eventually called Spanish tuning, which means you're using the open G, and start using the slide. Now, where did this come from? Well, we do know all the way over here, uh, sometime in the early part of the century. <clears throat> This guy is considered to be the father of the Hawaiian steel guitar, Kuluki Kuku. His name, real name is about this long. But, um, and what he did, he played what's called a lap style. He would put a guitar on his lap, and he would use a metal bar like this and use a, a nut to, to raise the, the strings off the, the fret and effectively change the pitch, what I just described a little bit earlier. This caught on in Hawaiian really big, and it starts not just influencing I mean, this would have been blues, but it, it starts in, you, you see this in a lot of the church hymns, right? You see it in popular tunes that would get exposed from California. So it really starts, it, it diversifies in really all kinds of musical forms in Hawaii. Well, he, like many other Hawaiian artists at the, that time, eventually started playing in North America or in the mainland, particularly in New Orleans, um, there was an exposition <clears throat> uh, where where he played and where Hawaiian music was featured, primarily because of his exoticism and this kind of thing. Now, I, I've got a quote here I want to mention to you that's kind of important. And that he played in Atlanta. That there's a reporter in the Atlanta Journal Constitution who said, well, he, he holds his listeners spellbound with his weird and strange music. Now, now just remember that, right? But the whole point being, you, you start to see Hawaiian artists playing everywhere, and pretty soon it starts showing up in a lot of forms. Ma Rainey, she's sort of a un, unheard of, unless you're a music, really a music nut like myself. But before blues, before there was Robert Johnson, and blues was old guy, black guys playing guitar. It was sort of a women's kind of genre. She had an Hawaiian guitarist from Hawaii in her band. Right? Uh, Lonnie Johnson, who uh, was probably in his day the most popular guitarist certainly in the blues world. We don't hear a lot about him today because he was too urbane. He wasn't like Muddy Waters. He didn't have that authenticity with him. But he actually played a song, many of you will know the, the movie, Blue Hawaii. Before it was a movie, it was a song, and he played that slide style. Um, Casey Bill Weldon, Weldon was from Arkansas, part of the Delta, right across the Mississippi River. Actually went by the name of Hawaiian Guitar Wood. B.K. Right? Uh, Turner for you East Texas folks, actually was referred to as his music, Hawaiian, where Hawaiian meets the Delta, right? Uh, Hawaiian lap style. He actually played the same the same way that was originally done here. Um, Louis Armstrong, I know we associate him with more of the jazz. His song, I'm the Market for You, which was a, a big hit in the 30s, used in Hawaiian uh, slide guitar. Um, Sun House, the gentleman in the upper left, uh, center there. Uh, if you are a blues nut, Right. He's like one of the icons because he played with um, Charlie Patton, the father of 
the Delta Blues. He played with Robert Johnson. He played with, he influenced directly Muddy Waters and a lot of other blues artists that some of you have probably heard of. Um, and he was known to play this uh, slide. He, he disappeared. One of the interesting stories about blues, he was working at a gas station. And some white college students who were blues nuts said they're gonna find him. And they went and found him and said, hey, come to New York. Um, they eventually had to teach him how to play again. He hadn't been, he hadn't really <laughs> ever played a guitar in a while. And they're interviewing. And of course, understand what they're trying to ask is like, well, where did you learn how to play this ancient way? And you know, this is did you learn this from a diddly blow, this from your grandfather? And he says, Ah, oh, it's not, it was the new style. When he and new, new to him that 1930, right? And he says, I'm playing the Hawaiian yeah. style, right? But the idea, he's even being sort of egged on to talk about his African roots, and he says, I don't know anything. Um, now, W.C. Handy, that if you saw the image earlier, one of the places we take, I take students in the Delta is a place where this story began, and he's considered the father of the blues because he was the first person to record it and copyright the song. Um, you know, this would, if, you, if you hear this today, it does not sound like Muddy Waters, it sounds more like ragtime. But what he, the story was, and it's a really interesting one, he was a, a, a formerly trained musician, um, big band leader in the Delta. He was in um, the town of Tutwiler, Mississippi, now population 50, probably might have been more people then. Um, and he was sleeping on a bench by a train station. And he said, well, I was awoken in the middle of the night by this strange and eerie sound. And he said he woke up and he looks across the, the track and sees this. He describes it in very colorful language, which is probably not appropriate for me to say now, but uh, he said he saw this guy. Think of the image we have of a blues artist. Right? He says he was loose jointed and had his toes were sticking out of his shoes. And he was playing the eeriest and strangest music I'd ever heard. And it was, he didn't say it was good. <laughs> he just says it was strange and eerie. The same reference to what the Atlanta Journal Constitution was talking about in our, in our Hawaiian friend. Uh, what did he do? Well, eventually he realized if I can convert this music to a sheet music, maybe I can make a record. And he did. It was the hottest selling record in the history at that time, right? Um, so, <clears throat> Little Milton. More recently, I want to say more recently in blues history, uh, he died in 2005, was asked, you know, uh, being interviewed, how did you learn how to play this way? He said, well, wow, I mean, diddly blow I, I had, I was trying to figure out how to play the Hawaiian way. Right? Uh, now, interesting about this, I, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things about blues, I, I'll tell you, most of the people who write about it are like me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, I don't know how to play. I just think it's really cool, right? And uh, in the 60s, a lot of people were like me, right? in more ways than one, I guess. But in a sense, they, you had people who were part of the appeal of this was it was this perceived to be ancient folk medicine, or music, not medicine, that gives me a window into another world and at that time, it was sort of perceived, the idea of it being perceived as African was, was in a sense, sort of trendy, right? Um, and it's, but you talk to musicians themselves, it's a wine way, right? Um, now, again, I could go on and on and on. I don't know how we're going for time here. Conclusion for now, um, you know, I think one of the things that we can get from this and everything else I didn't talk to you about, that, that that Southern music, I'm talking the Southern U.S. here, or in the Delta, the soundscape, if you want to think of that, uh, think of it that way, is way more complex. It's way more fluid and way more ethnically diverse than previously imagined. Uh, I mean, it, music is musicians by their very nature. If you're a good one, anyway, right? You you get influenced by whatever you can use to create your own sound. Right? Um, and again, the idea of Robert Johnson being this mythical person who you know set in the sold his soul and was African, you know, probably is uh, a myth, it's romanticized. It's a cool story, probably not reality. But I think the, the, the thing I could get from this is, is the Delta, um, I didn't mention this, and most of you may or may not have heard of this. <clears throat> um, it's always been described um, as the most Southern place on earth and not in the 
absolute sense geographically because it's always been perceived as being sort of outside of the his history of the rest of the country. It's been referred as the mirror of the South for that reason. Um, and somehow there's this idea that part of the uniqueness of it is because it's isolated. Right? And when we talk about Hawaii, one of the things, the first thing that we say is you're, you're, it's very isolated. Um, but Hawaii is like the Delta. I mean, I, I think the uniqueness of the, of the Delta is not maybe isolated now, but it's right on the Mississippi River. All those Hawaiian artists who would have came into New Orleans, probably the first thing they would have gotten a job of playing on a steamship that went up and down the Mississippi, right, right by the Delta. Right. I think you're, we're talking about a place that really is globally connected right, then. Not just in terms of music, either, in terms of other sort of historical things. Agricultural mechanization, for example. Right? First GPS unit I saw was in the Delta. Um, <clears throat> now, and, and one other thing I would, I would say about that, I, this, this is not by any means, am I suggesting that there's not an African influence in blues, uh, or an African American influence in blues. I, don't, I, that's, I, I think oh, wholeheartedly, as a form of musical expression, it was a mechanism for people like Muddy Waters, like Robert Johnson, like Little Milton, anybody else, to express their own individual collect or collective identity. But that's that's saying one thing. It's something totally different if you're trying to suggest that blues is somehow, its roots are inherently purely African or for that matter African American. I think that's probably not uh, a realistic assumption. Um, now again, I, I personally think this tells me that I would still maintain some of the blues artists I just talked about that, you know, Beethoven or Chopin, they don't have nothing on these guys. They were very, very talented. Um, but why were they talented? Because they were able to take bits and pieces from what they had around them and create something unique to express their own stuff. That's what all artists do, whether you're a musician or a painter. Uh, the other thing I, I talk a little bit more about that's, that's interesting is um, when you're in Hawaiian, in particularly traveling through Mississippi in the 50s and 60s, there's a, very likely, um, in fact, I would say go beyond very likely, I'm certain it happened to a degree, a lot of cultural collaborations. Um, because in Mississippi in 1960, it literally was black and white. And you were, if you were not white, you were black. Right? So what would happen to a Hawaiian artist? Where, you would, where would you eat? Yes, you may play in front of everybody. But when you're going to find a place to stay at night, it's going to be across the tracks. Right? Um, they actually played a lot of what we now call the Chitlin Circuit, the predominantly African American network. We, you wouldn't have seen a lot of white artists, for example, playing on that circuit. Um, so I don't think it was necessarily just a one way effect here. We probably had some cultural collaborations between those two, for lack of a better word, uh, ethnic cohorts that, that probably both influenced Hawaii and influenced the Delta and everything else. Which is an interesting question to think about. And finally, I think that to get back to this idea, what, why is it that then we we have um, this very uh, what I would argue almost oversold notion of blues history that's very limited and overgeneralized? I think when you're talking about music, um, you know, you, you got to understand the or anything about cult, the culture behind music. We're, we interpret it in a certain context. At the same time, the blues uh, revival was happening for a while. Blue, like, as I said, Sun House had dropped off the face of the earth to a bunch of white college kids says, hey, this is really cool. Now, all of a sudden, there's a big revival, something that's still going on today. Well, that was happening in the 60s. Well, what else was happening in the 60s? Well, the civil rights movement had evolved for different ways, and the black power movement had started. And I, I mentioned that as just one, one narrow context of the civil rights movement, but what you had seen at the same time in the 60s, if there was anything that was, um, I think, one of the more beneficial aspects of the civil rights movement, particularly in the United States South, was there, it, it facilitate, facilitated and created a social movement where there was a celebration of one's identity, right? So, you know, I, I like to talk about food, too. I don't have that much time to do it. But, you know, it, it's, <laughs> next, it's... Next time. About, you know, I remember that. Um, but at the same time that you start seeing blues revival, that's when we start using the term soul food. What is soul food? It wasn't like it was new. Now we're going to put another label to it right? because we're, we're, we're taking ownership in this. This is our heritage. Dashikis were worn. 
Afros. Uh, my point being that you started to see among the African American community a, a, a very emphasis on a positive sense of self, celebrating one's heritage, and a lot of people, uh, both scholars and sort of, I guess you would say, uh, just activists, would emphasize that music and other art forms is a way to facilitate this. So there was one, you know, uh, one famous poet. Uh, he went by the name of Leroy Jones, who changed his name, and he wrote a book named Blues People. And he, he wasn't a musician, but what he was trying to say with this, and it was a very influential text, was that you can understand the, the cultural experiences of African Americans. And he emphasized African Americans in 1963 right, um, by looking at the music, that we are a blues people, right? as if somehow the music encapsulated that experience of that entire population. Um, other thing I would tell you is what I like to use the term white mediator. And what I mean by that, I guess I am one in a way. Um, in, in a sense that much of what we know about blues, particularly Delta blues, is written by people who don't live there, <laughs> um, never lived there, and, and have kind of defined it for the rest of us. Right? Um, there's Perfect example, who decided that Robert Johnson was the greatest guitarist in the world? Anybody want to know that class? Eric Clapton did. Okay, he must know. Uh, I might, but other people would look at the records and say, Robert Johnson's records didn't really sell right, until after he was dead. And then we had, well, of course, Eric Clapton says the guy's God. And then he is. Right? But my point being, you know, a lot of the way we celebrate Bruce is, is, is written and expressed by people who aren't necessarily connected to its origins. The other thing, I, just an example, is that I'm, I'm talking about this in the modern period. Um, you know, this, this gentleman named Pratt here refers to blues as the blackest music. And I don't really, music to me doesn't have a color. It's organized noise, right? But I think that kind of, I'm, I've mentioned that. I'm not denying that this has any validity. My point being that it's just kind of encapsulating why why and how that we have this idea that somehow or another blues is sort of racially specific. Um, and to use another analogy, you know, um, you know, typically it, the Rolling Stones aren't part of blues artists. They call themselves that. We call them rock and roll artists, right? Uh, who, who do you see in a blues eye? I would say record store, but I guess they're sort of coming back, right? It seems like if you're above 50 and you're not a rapper and you're black, you've got to be a blues. Doesn't matter what the music sounds like. Steve Ray Vaughan, right? What's he? Rock and roll. And he's white. Right? He's pretty much a blues artist. But my point being, I, I think that, that all I wanted to really get across is that well, two things. Um, one, really, that music that, that somehow seems to be ignored. Now, I, I, I've talked a little bit to a few people about this. And, um, you know, uh, I've been involved in, <clears throat> in the Mississippi creating a, a blues trail. And these are just markers that you see all over the place, in the delta that either where somebody was born or someone died or something happened. That's a big business in Mississippi. You get a blues marker, it means something because tourists will come. Um, I don't think you all need any help with tourists, do you? Uh, so <laughs> I, I guess what I'm, my point being is it's not really part of, it, I don't want to accuse the state of not celebrating their heritage, but the, the point being why it, 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 the reason it's celebrated and interpreted in certain ways is broadly based on other sorts of context. Right? Um, and finally, <clears throat> you know, talk about my good friend here. Right? Um, I assume you guys know who this guy is. Right? Um, everything I just talked about, I've shared with him. He agreed. Right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? no. But anyway, I, again, I appreciate your time. I hope I didn't bore you. I know this wasn't controversial. I can, I can make it controversial if you want. Yeah. Don't you think uh, the wars that we have been in, World War One, World War II, Korean, helped spread blues oh, absolutely. to Europe, to J Japan, to Korea? Don't you think they had a lot of influence? Because the, the men that went over there, not a majority of them were musicians, but a lot of them you know, love the blues music, love the I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you could even argue uh, on post-war radio, the radio stations that were originally created were, were partly during the, for military purposes initially, to entertain the troops yeah. also. But yes, 
I mean, you could, you know, that, that had a big influence even on record sales. Um, but if, when you have questions, uh, how influencer do you think Billie Holiday was in the music blues? Well, I would call her a blues artist. Right? Um, great. But, you know, again, that, this might be a conversation you and I have. I, I think she's generally not considered to be a blues artist. Right? Uh, but her music certainly is. But I think she, at the time that she was popular, blues wasn't the hip thing, right? So you don't call yourself blues. Yeah. But if you listen to her today, if you, you know, you pull it up on your phone or something, you listen to some of her music, you think of blues. Yeah, I'm certainly. No doubt. I think, I think a lot of her, you know, I'm, I, I mentioned organized noise. When we start differentiating genres of music, it's largely marketing. The, the people who would tell you that's that don't seem to recognize these things are musicians. Um, so yes, I would certainly think she's a blues. Anybody else? I think what? there's an essential sadness to blues music that goes through uh, the whole genre. It, it brings through a very human feeling of, of great, great sadness and longing. And that's very typical of the black music, and also of, of some of the music of, the, of all kinds of places in the South. Yeah, I, you know, if I, if I may disagree a little bit, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't, I would say that's maybe perhaps that that assumption is oversimplified. And I think, to me, and this is a scientific evidence, so we all have different opinions. I think uh, blues is a way to express something. Um, not all blues is sad. It's a, way, it's a way to talk about our lives. Um, there's certainly in, I, I guess, the user term, black music, there's, it seems to express sadness or, or conditions. So at the same time, a lot of B.B. King's music sounds very happy to me. Um, you know, so I, I think um, there's no, I don't, I'm, and I'm, my point being, again, it's the idea of context uh, that matters here. At a certain time, music music would have expressed sadness when there were conditions that would, would, would lead to that emotion. <laughs> this you. one or that one? The whole thing. Thank you. Oh, okay. No, thank you. Oh, this, Let this, me thank this you. Is great. Why do they call that genre blues? Which genre are you talking about? The blues. Why do they call? About. See, here again. I, I, I'll, what what do we normally think? It's because we're blue, right? Mm -hmm. No, it was blue notes. That, that's the certain notes of the scale are called blue notes by musicians. Even before blues existed as a genre. Uh, at least as an identifiable label. So, um, and, and even the, that's generally considered to be where it was called blue. Um, but it became, I, I think one might argue, you know, Buddy Waters, Robert Johnson, and things like this. You, you're talking about a context where people would have really been blues in the emotional sense you're describing. And all of a sudden, that's what becomes popular. Um, I'm no artist, I'm just a struggling academic. But if I was a struggling artist, you're my market. I'm gonna give you what you want to hear. You want to hear sadness? I'm blue. Um, so I, I think that was partly where that that, that reference sort of took that meaning. I, I don't agree with you. <laughs> As a young woman, I was very active, and I used to sing in the community. Uh, you know, sing solos, and I did a lot of, of uh, songs that were from that from that period. They're very you know slow, sad. Like, I hate to see the evening sun go down and all that. And it was very, very typical of me that of what you're talking about. Because the blues were very, there's a very, very sad area that goes through it. Even if, well, there's some that were happy, of course, but, but just the same. I think there's a definite side to it that's very, very deep and very sad. Well, I, like I said, I would agree with you. It's, it's a, it's a, a musical expression that is used to express emotions in a part of your one's life. And if you're sad, then it's, gonna, it's a great way to express that. So, uh, a lot of blues you, you dance to. I, mean, you know, I guess what, I'm, what we would say here is you got to ask yourself, what, what is blues? Um, I don't know if there's any clear definition of that, right? even when you're talking about color. Because I'm just responding to one part of what you're saying. Every time I heard Billie Holiday, I always felt. I listen to her quite a bit. I guess. But it's interesting, you don't normally.